Hi, you're about to play Spirit Island in a wonderful evening together with your friends. All that you need to do is make sure to get some wonderful spirit food so you can feed everyone and remind everyone of the joys you had as children playing in the fields and caressing the wheat. To give our dish base we're going to use quinoa which is wonderful and it reminds me of my youth and how we as children used to pick at tree roots and just nibble on them a little bit, just try them you know and see what they're like. To give the dish a little bit more substance we're going to have to add a little bit of very nice Oaty porridge, which reminds me of my childhood and how we used to be naughty when my mums made us eat porridge for breakfast and we used to sneak in chocolate inside. And this one doesn't have chocolate, just fruits. Finally, we're going to add some red quinoa and corn bulgur. Now, I know what you're going to say, we've already added quinoa, but this is red quinoa and it reminds me of my childhood and the, just the different types of crayons I used to have. Some of them would be yellow and some of them would be red and ah, oh, the pictures that I used to paint. So nice. Now we're going to mix it all together with our hands. Just don't be afraid to touch it, it's not going to bite you. And we need to add a little bit of spice and kick to this dish. So we're going to add one of the best spices in the world, water. Which reminds me of my childhood and how we used to look for woodland streams and just gorge ourselves into its, in its wonderful flavors. Just a little bit of water to round it out. Mmm, it's gonna taste it. Just dip in there right with your hands. And don't be afraid, don't be scared. Mmm, but mmm, delicious. Now I just have to wait for my friends to come. I'm sure they'll be here any moment. If you're slightly newer to our hobby, if you're not deeply entrenched into it, if you haven't played this, this or this, but would like to give this cooperative luck a go, then my friends, I don't recommend you watch the rest of this video. In fact, just go and get yourself this and you know what, you will have many brilliant hours of enjoyment and surprises and wonderful things happening to you. But for the rest of you, if you are a little bit like me, if you find yourself constantly pulling out empty baggies out of your pockets, then I've got a wonderful idea to show you. And I say a little bit like me, I don't mean the crazy hair or the flannel shit. Is this what really defines me? Spirit Island is a simple proposition in the same way that run through this motorway is a simple proposition. It's not hard to execute and could potentially be quite fun, but it requires a lot of skill and practice to make it out on the other side alive. In Spirit Island, you will be playing a spirit and not just any spirit, but a fantastically named spirit. If the artwork and design of Spirit Island is the first thing that stands out, and it should, then the next thing should be the naming conventions. River Surges in Sunlight is perhaps my favorite board game character name ever lovingly printed onto cardboard, and whilst I don't expect you to feel the same way, I ask that you at least try and appreciate the beauty of these. Like in every other cooperative game, you will be pitted against a system. Defeat it and you win, simple. You and up to three other spirits will be defending an island, your island your home and guess what someone wants to come and take it away from you the worst kind of someone people these settlers are represented by explorers and the towns and cities that they build clear the map off of them and you get yourself a perfectly harmonious island i also find it quite amusing that a strength one invader is a person and a strength two invader becomes a town for some reason okay move forward a bit move forward no backwards a little bit backward, there, there, now we gently land it down, land it down, oh, yeah, that's It's been said before, but isn't it wonderful to have a game that approaches colonialism from a completely different angle? I mean, I love Mombasa, but isn't it nice to have a heavy, crunchy Euro that doesn't force you to be a complete bastard? Don't get me wrong, I am fascinated by colonialism. 
But in the same way I'm fascinated with car crashes. And don't worry, there's no Cronenberg and Hanky Panky going on. Unless that Hanky Panky comes from a delicious smooshing of game elements and Spirit Island has plenty of those. Unless I haven't made it clear yet, Spirit Island is a crunchy nut but we'll have to get to how and why in just a little bit because first I want to tell you about about the challenges you're going to be facing. Each round the game tells you where the invaders will ravage. As long as there's at least a town or two explorers on any given corresponding land, they will spoil that land causing blight. If there are no more blight tokens left on your board, your home is ruined. Then if that wasn't enough, those same colonists will build more towns or cities on corresponding lands, increasing their numbers. Finally, to keep things just a bit more mysterious, a new card is revealed denoting the land where more explorers will appear, setting foot into even more territory that doesn't belong to them. And then of course, all these cards slide down, meaning that the lands they've built on will be ravaged and the lands they've explored will be built on. And so the cycle continues until you get rid of them. It is so refreshing to have a cooperative game that doesn't just want you to prepare blindly and hedge your bets against whatever unexpected consequences it might bestow upon you. You know exactly where trouble is brewing and you know what you need to do to stop it. But don't for a second think that you're getting away easy. The human greed machine is an unstoppable tide and you are just a spirit, just an idea bestowed with incorporeal powers of nature. Maybe, just maybe, you can chase the invaders away from the lands they're about to ravage, but then they'll build and they'll explore and they will come in ever greater numbers. You will be overwhelmed. And this is where it gets complicated. Your powers are listed on cards and whether it's withering crops or creating dolphins by embodying water with lightning or an actual frigging tsunami or possessing someone's dreams and giving them ideas of fear, I kid you not, you can do it. The only question is when you can do it. You have the invader phase that we just described before where the baddies do their damage and your powers activate before and after the invader phase. Now naturally you want to do it before the invader phase. You want to get your sausage roll now before you're late for work and skip the queue. But the game isn't designed that way. Most powers that do damage have a turtle which is an iconographic way of saying they are slow. Now slow powers are normally pretty good but the problem is that they happen after the invader phase, after most of the damage to the island has already been done. Now some powers give you a bird, which is an iconographic way of saying they're fast, however, they rarely affect the state of the board, such as giving you a defense value. Defense value, simply you choose a land and it has defense now, meaning it shrugs up some of the damage but doesn't actually do anything to the invaders. Now, of course, exceptions exist, but they normally cost a lot of energy, which is yet another precious resource that is used to cast cards, or sometimes your powers are affected by range. Most powers relate to presents, which are these pips that you put onto certain territories on the board, or sacred sites, which is just a fancy way of saying that a land has two pips. And with so many variables, fast or slow, and energy and elements, which we haven't even mentioned yet, and range, you could get so overwhelmed just choosing a couple of cards that you're going to play. We found ourselves so bamboozled by what cards we were going to play, we didn't even have time to look at what the other player was doing. A great way to eliminate the ever-present alpha gamer syndrome in cooperative games. Choosing which card you're going to play, five minutes of that can seem like an hour has whooshed by. And then once you actually decide and show the other player what you're going to do, you realize that if you execute your plan together, then you'll probably lose the game. So you go back to the drawing board and it's like having a developmental business meeting in your company, but first brainstorming ideas in your own individual department and having that meeting to discuss those ideas, realize it would bankrupt the company and then just order some pizza and iterate until you have something that doesn't end in total catastrophe. This complexity is compounded by a word that makes my crotch just a smidge wet with excitement, asymmetry. No matter which spirit you settle on playing, you will have a different experience than other players. Lightning Swifting Strike is pretty simple. Your slow powers can become fast powers, and of course, because you're lightning, you blast everything, or you can choose to play something a little bit more esoteric, like Ocean's Hungry Grass, which is incredibly strong at the outskirts of the board by where the oceans are, 
but not very influential in the center. God, I love asymmetry, but I am also terrified of asymmetry because it can make the game feel varied and different each time you play, or it can make it feel stale and boring as people settle onto an idea of what they should be doing, and this is good, and this is good, and you should be doing that or that, and you shouldn't be doing that. That's just boring. Or, amongst gaming people, known as meta. Being a cooperative game, however, Spirit Island dodges all of that, so what if you find a really potentially strong combination of characters? The game has more levels of difficulty than an average student has on Wash Socks, emitting an odour that is an altogether different kind of spirit. Teen spirit. But even at its most basic difficulty, the game will be rough going because on your first playthrough all you'll be doing is just focusing on the lands that are about to get ravaged and trying to stop that from happening, blind to everything else that's going on and overwhelmed by the myriad of options and your poor little brain will melt into a puddle. But then as you play the game more, you start to realize that you need to plan and just like a teenager, let some things slide. Maybe it's okay to let a certain land be blighted and just lose one of these pips and prepare for what's coming next. Utilize your slow powers to actually affect things on the next round. Anyway, Fear, which is yet another resource in the game. Anytime you destroy a town or a city, you get to move some fear on this fear track. But more importantly, you have powers that generate fear, but don't necessarily have a lot of impact on the board, adding more bits onto here. And once you add all the bits, you get to put the next fear card down onto the board. And crucially, you don't know what it does, but when it does resolve itself, it will often do something that's quite useful and nasty to the invaders. And it's just like an extra little bit of icing on the cake. And so many times the fear cards have surprised us at how much useful they felt. But more importantly, once you move more fear cards down, you terrorize the people so much that you have to actually do less to win the game. Removing all the white pieces from the board can seem like a monumental, inaccomplishable task. But with the assistance of fear, you don't have to do as much anymore. You just have to show the invaders some financial projections of their business venture and they're, they're like, nah, we better leave, it's not worth sticking around here. This is where the game comes together for me, where it comes alive, not just this fear mechanism, but how it all blends together into a dream that you might just achieve. It's too chaotic to compute, too unwieldy to take control of, so all you can do is have an idea, a vision, and hope that that vision pans out. And whilst for most of the game you'll be too busy focusing on your side of the island, hoping that the other players take care of theirs, you will have to find those crucial moments of cooperation to make sure you succeed. And isn't that just what all good cooperative games are about. Let me show you what I mean. In one of the games, we were completely overwhelmed. Most of the land was blighted. We were actually running out of physical components to put on the board. And it was clear that we were not going to survive the next invader phase. I was playing a spirit called Shadows Flicker in Flames, which largely causes fear and pushes the invaders around rather than removing them, whereas Elaine was playing Vital Strength of the Earth, which defends the land, but doesn't really remove any of the invaders. Meaning that our gameplay was largely revolving at preventing bad things from happening, but the invaders kept coming and coming and coming and overwhelming us, but that was fine. We had a game plan and we were gonna stick to it. On the upside, however, we caused a lot of fear. We were at terror level three, meaning we were in the invaders' heads and all we had to do was remove the five cities. Doesn't matter how many white pieces there are on the board, as long as we can remove the five cities, we win the game. But it was only our fast actions that mattered because as soon as the invader phase hits, we lose the game. And five cities is a lot. Sometimes on a turn, you're happy you can remove one. So it was a tall order, but then I played my card Winds of Rust and Anthropy that replaced cities with towns, and because of its special ability I could repeat it again, and because of Elaine, Elaine's character's special ability I could repeat that card again, meaning three of the cities were gone, and then Elaine played a card that said, well, a fourth city was destroyed, and <laughs> we were one city short. So all I had to do was dip into this new card deck, Draw, draw four cards, for, and find a fast power.
that destroyed a city. If one was in here, we would win the game. And I'm not going to tell you whether we did or not, because that's not what matters. What matters is the feeling of anticipation you get when you draw those cards. Spirit Island is a dream, a wonderful dream of a complex cooperative game. But the thing about dreams is, well, they only feel real when we're in them. It's only when we wake up that we realize that something is actually strange. It's easy to see why Spirit Island is exciting with asymmetric powers, varied card play and gripping moments, but it does have its weak points. This box contains a massive contribution of eight different artists and some of the artwork on the cards will seriously make some competitive card games feel jealous of just how astoundingly beautiful it is. But the problem is not the artwork itself, but the formatting of the cards, which is just also 2005. I mean, most of it is just brown and the artwork itself is hidden in this tiny little box. I get that full art cards are a little bit more expensive to produce, but if you went through the effort of hiring eight different artists for the game, showcase their work. The other problem, however, is a little bit more Mm, yeah, and what I mean by that is that some players will love it and some players will hate it. And it's the fact that as a system, as an adversarial system, as the thing you're meant to defeat in Spirit Island, well, it's just almost this nine penetrable giant ice ball. And unlike other games like Pandemic, where you're given clear directions as what to, to what you're meant to do to defeat it, here you're just given hundreds of cards or the equivalent of a hundred tiny little ice picks and you're meant to claw your way inside and somehow just break that giant ball. It's less elegant and less cohesive and you're kind of meant to find your own way around and I can imagine that for some people that will be absolutely what draws them into this game and makes them feel invested and for others it's just gonna be a straight no-go. And honestly, at times Spirit Island can feel a bit bogged down, repeatedly churning through cycles of its own systems, advancing ever so slowly, sometimes heightened by a poor selection of spirits. Whilst the game recommends you starting spirits in a two-player game with no one to guide you, you could easily end up with a selection that just doesn't complement each other very well. And a four-player game? That is just pure chaos and I wish the best of luck even to the best strategists untangling that particular white plastic piece puzzle. Yeah, these are minor blemishes in a box that continuously invites you to challenge yourself and explore its depths. Explore ironically because you're playing against explorers. Will shadows flick in flame stack well with ocean's hungry grasp? Will one of them work better on the thematic side of the board which by the way doesn't just look different it plays different, and when is finally the time to break out the expansion that offers two new spirits and a variety of different ways to play the game, and in a no pun included first, it's a core game from a Kickstarter campaign that feels like it is a core game, not missing an expansion, but already has an expansion that feels like an expansion. Spirit Island is a dream. It's an idea of a deep, complex, cooperative, card-driven mishmash. And do you know what? Even if it is a dream, then excuse me while I stay in this dream for just a little bit longer because I'm really enjoying myself. If you enjoyed this video, you don't have to eat red quinoa to enjoy Spirit Island, but what you do have to do is subscribe to No Pun Included, where we do videos every week. We try doing them on Thursdays, doesn't always work, but we've got some wonderful stuff coming up. And if you really, really like us and want us to support us until our next Kickstarter goes live next year, you can always purchase our digital Gloomhaven adventure promo, which was part of our Kickstarter last year, but is purchasable on this button right here. You can click it. But if you don't want to do any of that, just, you know, say hi, say hello in the comments below. Say what you think about Spirit Island. Do you think it's a cool game or maybe not? Or maybe you're excited about something else. Let us know. Who knows? Maybe we'll cover it.